Thank you very much, indeed. Okay, well, the plenary session is not only a very good opportunity to learn about high-level strategic and technical aspects of our field, but it also gives us a chance of learning about professional experiences that are connected to our field and which can include some useful message, maybe a lesson, maybe a historical reflection on the past or anticipating the future that might be closer than what we actually think. Our next speaker, well, let me, let somebody else introduce our next speaker. My name is Vince Cerf. I'm Google's chief internet evangelist and I'm one of the co-inventors of the internet. And I want to talk to you about an absolutely amazing book that a friend of mine, Andreo Vea, has spent 19, nearly 20 years working on. He's done 320 interviews. He's got 800 people that he talks about who were the, help, the creators of the internet all around the world. This book is a compendium of the story of the internet's creation. And it's created in the process a friendship for me with people all around the world, but particularly friends in Barcelona and in Madrid, where I've discovered that the friendliest people in the world live. So this book is something that you will treasure if you get your hands on it, because it's a resource with stories that are personal in nature, but that tell the story of the internet over a long period of its development. So I can recommend it to you, and I certainly recommend knowing Andreo Vea, who knows everybody in the world because of all the interviews that he's done. So if you need to get in touch with someone, he's the guy you need to talk to. Welcome. Good morning. Hey. Buen dia, Good morning, everybody. I am really honored to be here today and to try to, to start up my presentation. Here we are. So I would like to start thinking that the history of the internet is full of myths. It's not in 14 years and without a word, most of the things that we know today are failed, are not right. So normally my last uh, speech was in a completely different environment. A lot of people, I was very nervous to speak in front of this audience. But today I feel like at home, right? It's all, most of you are engineers, most of you are passionate for fiber optics, as I am. So, as an average, humans, we have uh, 700,000 hours of duration. Oh, there is oh, a grandma, it lasts more sometimes. But as an average, you have 700,000. If you are counting the hours that you are sleeping, let's talk about almost 500,000 huh? awake. So if we are 1,000 people here, I have to run huh? to keep my half an hour time to, to be very pro right? and to be uh, useful for your thinking. As you probably know, we are in a country that produces olive oil. <clears throat> While I was preparing this conference, this speech, I was thinking, what can I tell all these smart people that they don't know about lasers, about fiber optics. Let's find something interesting. Spain produces almost half of the production worldwide of olive oil. In some countries, uh, this is very expensive to buy. Here, it's very cheap. But you know that there are so many kinds of olive oil. And the healthiest and the best, and probably the most expensive, is the extra virgin olive oil. When? If you go to the supermarket and you want to bring home some oil, what should you do? Well, you take your laser, green laser, <laughs> and then 
you do this test. It's very easy. You have different kind of oils. In this case, we have canola oil in the left-hand side, water, and extra virgin. Your green laser pointer will go red. Can you see this? As better the oil is, redder will be this light. That's important. <laughs> so, how do I structure my speech today? It's very innovative. Eh? I will talk about the past, then I will go to the present, and I will try to predict the future, which is more difficult than predicting the past. That's why I, I focus on history. I have used this, an acoustic modem of 300 bits per second. An actual backbones go to 300 gigabits or more. That's a thousand million factor. Eh? A thousand million factor in my old time. And I, I, I hope to last 40 years more. So let's see what happened. This was mine too. Remember? Super high speed infrared connection between devices. I became the director of internet in a second telco career when Spain opened to and I read in 2002 my doctoral thesis. I'm talking about this because this changed my life. Bin Cerf, the guy who spoke before, read and write the foreword to my thesis and invited me to Stanford to keep working over there. So I quit my job and I went there. Silicon Valley? No, this is San Francisco. This is not Silicon Valley. <laughs> this is Silicon Valley, a place where there, has a, there is a couple of internet companies and technology companies. And my office at Stanford, I was so happy, but everything was, I was so proud, but I was earning zero dollars per month. So as I'm used to speak and eat three times a day, I had to invent something, uh, bringing companies from Spain to the Silicon Valley. So I brought 800 companies from which uh, 12 w got implanted in the Silicon Valley. In 2000, this was my working environment at Cisco, localizing tele telephones and things like that, because otherwise, if you just translate, not localize, you don't get a word. It's like park call, llamada aparcada, in Spanish would be llamada retenida. Otherwise, if you it's, it's not easy to, to, to translate these things. Meanwhile, uh, I start up an organization that's called We Will, Who is Who in the Internet World, which is a, a research program. And what are we doing? So we're just collecting the stories of the internet pioneers all around the world in digital format to preserve for future generations. Imagine that you can listen right now to Thomas Alva Edison or to Graham Bell from their own voices telling you, well, I invented this uh, uh, incandescent light doing this and that. So this is very easy. You just record the people right now. In 50 years, you can listen to them why they invented the email, why they invented the FTP. So we are recollecting all these artifacts and we archive and store it. So all these interviews must be easy to understand from primary sources. This is important and all digital. Well, I was known as the internet myth master because I was trying to break all this myth. As you know, the internet is a, a US invention, right? And it's the daughter of the ARPANET. And was born in 1969, almost like me. In fact, I, I was born uh, one day before the first uh, protocol. That means I am from the pre-internet era. It was built to withstand a nuclear, a nuclear attack from the Soviets. And it was created by a small group at a public agency, what's called ARPA. That's right, right? Let's see. The first is, maybe this is the best uh, image I found to represent the internet. But this internet was created in, imagine the Cold Era, when Soviets could bomb all this country. The crumbs, the, the, the unique things that rest after this bombing should work in, should keep working. That's why the internet was created. False. This is a myth. So let's talk about the 
prehistory of the internet. These four groups, different groups, people from the MIT, people from the National Physics Laboratory in London, the RAND Corporation, were working in parallel to discover what we call the packet switching. Packet switching is the, the foundation of this kind of communications. So they met in 1967 and they discovered that they, working, they were working in the same thing. This right now doesn't happen anymore because people before starting working on a field try to research if somebody else is doing the same. But not at the time it couldn't be done. So they met and probably from this interview on Larry Roberts where he tells me, it's this from this paper, the guy from Paul Baren, eh, the nuclear myth guilty, this guy was the one who was making uh, a military-based uh, uh, research, but not the others. It's from this paper that this rumor was start, but this is totally false. The ARPANET was created to explore computer resource sharing. This is Paul Baren. When you see a black belt here, it's a bad sign. That he passed away a few years ago. All these internet pioneers are completely unknown citizens right now. So I'm trying to give them a voice eh, in history. Duke Engelbert, you used computers with screens because him. And you probably know him because he's the mouse inventor. And check the mother of all demos on the internet and you will see part of his life and his work. In 1969, this team created the first router. This is what's like a fridge, you can see the size. This woman, a perfectly unknown woman, is the creator of the first um, gateway, software gateway. In 1972, Dave Box and Bob Metcalf, they created the ethernet. Why? Because it was going through the ether the ether, then came cable, and now with Wi-Fi, we go to the ether again, 40 years later. This is Ron Crane, who said, bah, this is so s slow. Let's create the fast ethernet from 10 to 100 megabits per second. This is Paul Mokapetris, a perfectly known person, but every time you send an email, you're using his invention. Every time you're browsing a, a web page, you're also using his invention. He created the DNS, the domain name system. If you probably use the Wikipedia, you know him, it's Jim Wales. And all the work since day one was international and open. I mean, it's not a matter of one country doing something. This is probably uh, the most unknown paper from the internet, 1977, uh, with the origin, the real origin of the internet. The first time, three different connections and three different access technologies were used to connect SatNet, on satellite, ARPANET, a terrestrial network, and also PRNet, packet radio net. Three different things that were connected in Norway, London, University College of London, and also the US at SRI, Stanford Research International. In 1977, the internet could be called the catnet. Why? Because Louis Poussin, a French guy who created Cyclades, was connected to the ARPANET in red and also the National Physics Laboratory Network. These three different networks, they were working uh, packet switching, were connected. So this is the first experiment, eh, that, but they finally decided instead of catnet, to call it the internet. This is in 1984, his, his French team, and this was in 2008 during his personal interview. So what they did is to collect all these guys, which most of them are pretty old already, and put them together and interview them, record their voices one by one, and create documents that can tell you that the internet is, wasn't a single network. You can see that there were 46 different technologies competing in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s that finally converged to the internet. And as you can see, the ARPANET is not the mother of the internet. We could call the mother of the internet the NSFNet, the National Science Foundation Network. I did a book, this is not a, a, 
is not an advertising. It's just calling, uh, telling you that after 20 years of this research, I put this in uh, almost five, 600 pages book, which uh, is really successful and I'm happy of it. Why? Because I did an innovation. You can listen their voices within the book. I put a, a QR code and you can scan and send you an MP3 and you can listen directly the pioneers talking to you, telling you what they did and why. These are probably the most important projects I did in the last five years together. So these are the 320 people which I call VIP, viejos y pobres, eh? old and poor. Yeah, nobody know them. Let's talk about the present. The present. These are the billionaires, probably if you see their faces in the Force homepage, you don't know who are they. But if I click, you could probably know now better what they did and how they made millionaires themselves. Let's talk about technologies. Is this the future? What the long-term solution is? The DSL, I don't tell. Well, it's a miracle that you can go uh, like let's say one megabit per second in this copper combo. Check the red circles. Huh? It's a miracle that one megabit per second goes like this. How do we replace millions of analog and rusty copper pairs? Hmm? This guy, probably you don't know him, but he's a professor in my department, John Choffey. It's the DSL inventor. He gets one dollar, just one dollar, for each modem and router, DSL router that is sold in the world. But this is the bad guy. The good guys would be this, right? It's uh, <laughs> Charles Cow, uh, which took 20 years from the invention of the fiber optics to go to the market. He got the Nobel Prize in 2009. And also Donald Keck, on the left hand side, who achieved the less than 70 degrees per kilometer at Corning. We are talking about 1970. If you have to deploy this big network, the first you have to do is to research the, the country where you want to deploy it. And Spain, as you can see, as all the countries, is north and south. Richest part, poorest part. I don't know why, but it's, this is like this. And the, the, the population is scattered in different ways. It's a smaller population and smaller villages and towns. The inhabitants, almost 50 million, and there are 14 million homes that Telefonica, he said already, are uh, passing through. How many years do you need to reach the return of the investment? It's completely different. Eh? Madrid and Barcelona, the biggest towns, is uh, one or two years, but if you go to the smaller towns on the right-hand right side, you can see that it's almost 15 years. That means that Telefonica or other telcos will never go and fiber these little towns, these little villages, probably in the next 20 years. I'm not exaggerating. Until now, we are doing things like this. But now, there are um, like technologies like vertical and laid fiber that with minimal disruption to the community, you can deploy your fiber. Minimizing the cost, just making a cut, and then you clean it and put the fiber. Really quick. So the road works, instead of 45 days, you just, in two days, you can deploy it. Let's talk about the politicians. Imagine a mayor of a city, the mental energy required for this guy. The first time, the first time, I'm very serious. Everybody can know that quick money on right of way. In fact, all the cities, they charge you money to deploy the fiber. Well, not everybody can arrive here. That, well, if I deploy fiber in my city, I will lower or my own communication cost. More time it's needed to see, for them to see, that lower cost for local industry will be achieved if you deploy fiber in all your community. And not and most of them <laughs> don't arrive to see that the quality of life of people and new industry will come over to your city if you have a friendly fiber city. That's why I developed for a government, for a local government of Catalonia, 
a few years ago from Stanford. I developed a grassroots program which is called Volunteers for the Fiber. And it's so easy to see that if we define some specs eh, of interconnection, some minimum standards of quality to follow, and also the town councils can tell unemployed people, volunteers, eh, to install fiber in the street of all villages, they, they can get compensated easily. Eh? Because, for instance, giving them 100 megabits per second a couple of years for free, if you guys, eh, we are not talking big cities, we are, we are talking rural. Eh? So if, you tell, if I tell you, put the fiber from your home to this place, and you will get two years of free internet access, probably they will do it. So we need an alternative telecom network made of fiber optics, which should be neutral, no gold guardians allowed, with high capillarity and silly, but very efficient and with high capacity. And we are already 19 years late, since 1995 of the fiber law. Following all these ideas, there is a white Giphy, Giphy, they call it Giphy.net, which is an open, free, and neutral grassroots uh, network that started in Catalonia a few years ago. And this is a non-profit foundation. And they are doing, they are following this thing that I was talking about. I'm going to give you, because uh, I open it as a Creative Commons, my research document. It's a 34 document that I don't want to tell you more about this, but you can find it here. Yeah? We will dot org that cat fiber. A quick recap. We see that the internet is not a pure US invention. It's not the daughter of the ARPANET. It's the daughter of the NSFNET. It wasn't born in 1969, but in 1977, wasn't built to withstand a nuclear attack and not created by a small group of public agency, but for 800 or more people around the world. Let's talk about the future. Now I'm going to be very sure. If you ask me about network, I will tell you that networks in the future will be faster, smaller, cheaper, and pervasive. And you will say, oh, yes. If we are talking about services, I won't tell you nothing. I don't know. Who predicted SMS? No one. Even the telcos were, wow. Who predicted Hotmail, a free email, or Skype, f talking for free? Would never be thought within a telco. Or Facebook, or WhatsApp. And then all these different services that appear. I'm going to put numbers on something that you already think and know, which is SMS traffic in 1,000 millions per day, message of day. And see that in 2015, WhatsApp, which is growing so much, has already taken this figure. And why telcos don't like the internet much? Well, a gigabyte of SMS was 30,000 euros. A gigabyte of WhatsApp is six euros. Well, 3G, you can charge 18 euros per gigabyte per month. Wi-Fi, oof, if I charge one euro, it's, it's good enough. So I am an electrical engineer, and this is already obsolete. Now we are talking about radio, radioelectric spectrum, fibers, and if you take all this radioelectric, all this spectra, from left to right, all the wireless channels, cell phones, FM radios, TVs, all them, and you take just one fiber with the actual technology, you can place all 25,000 times all the spectrum. So we are talking about different worlds. Remember, 25,000. Talk a, bit, a little bit of image. Normally, when you go to the doctor and you visit, you said, oh, this is x-ray thing. Wow, I don't see anything. You can now see something, even the water falling down. You can see red cells, skin burns, taste buds, red blood cells, Li-Fi using like, but instead of Wi-Fi. 
as a good, not good photographer, but uh, with almost a million pictures in my laptop, I would urge you to change from all the memories, hard drive you have to this. After five years within the Pacific Ocean, you remove this card uh, and you up upload the, the pictures as is. So it's very strong. About 3D printing, you probably heard about that now, it's a maker thing. Well, you can print complex meshes like these ones that you can see here, even difficult to imagine. And you can even print food. I ate already a pizza, a printed pizza, which is was, well, the taste of, well, can be improved, okay? <laughs> can be improved, yeah, we are a country that we value uh, eating well, as you know and candies, and fashion. I'm not gonna talk about fashion because everybody has their own taste. Have you printed your dream home already? You just change your ink. You put concrete, and that's it. <laughs> Easy, isn't it? Artificial school, a little girl was saved a few months ago in the Netherlands, where the uh, Polytechnic uh, University of Catalonia created, scanned, and printed this artificial school. It was replaced it, and she's alive. You can pr print prosthetic eyes, 150 per hour. That means that it's cheaper than going like that. Huh? Synthetic skin, ears, noses. You can print your own nose if you have an accident and you break it. Or the most difficult things, bones on your chin. Reconstruction, exoskeletons, and let's replace the cast. So itchy, remember that. And this guy from Brazil created the robo hand. With 50 euros, you can replace your hands, and it's all open to print. And he created also the robo leg, 100 euros. But if we are going to the top of the edge of this, the next generation of bionics is this thing. This guy was a professor of MIT and had an accident, but he keeps doing his dream, which is climbing mountains. And he created this thing for her, so she can still dance in public. Before my friend Tan Lee, an electroencephalogram system was costing around a million dollars. After her, this cost 400 euros. And guess what? You can play just thinking. You can manage computer just thinking. It's much cheaper, it's much easier, and it's much natural. And what else? I have a friend who has a, a pet shop hmm, that you can install this to your dog and let him decide what his house should be. Why you have to decide for him? You put all the houses there and you can tell which house gets him more excited. Probably heard about uh, these, but we are talking about wearables, but now the, topping, uh, the top uh, edge is the ingestible. Huh? Things that you ingest, these pills, and with your own uh, acid, you create a uh, uh, pile to, to power these, these things. It's powered by you. Also, you can put all these things that it looks like uh, the futuristic. It's already a product. Yeah. You swallow, you are 10 hours of fasting, and you get back 144,000 color images hmm, of everywhere, of your track. And this replaces a 3,000 euros colonoscopy. And it's a commercial product, as I told you, for just 300 euros. Using it already, I have a friend that uh, use it in a hospital. Well, you have these RFID chips that are getting implanted in more and more people, especially in Mexico right now, uh, so people getting kidnapped. And something which is less invasive, why I have been through a surgery recently, and at 4 a.m. they wake up you to measure your temperature. Taking the temperature of a patient every four hours is just four samples per day, which is useless. Why don't you get something like this, patch, and you can get
variables. Things we wear, wear tech. Well, they are developing some uh, contact lens that measure the level of glucose of your eyes here uh, in your tears. I am uh, serving a company which is called Social Diabetes that is very, very behind this to see that you don't need to pinch 10 times per day if you are a diabetic. If we are talking about body replacements, could you tell me which is the one, the one, one tool and the other is the prosthetic? If I have you little this, now you know. Internet of things. Everybody talks about the internet of things, but what is the internet of things for you? In my case, my house was like a plant cemetery, okay? I always forget to what are my plants. Right now, I can, the plant is telling me, oh, I am sunlight, the temperature is okay, but I don't have enough water. Every time I water my plants, you can say, as how the degrees, how the, the humidity level is decreasing. And he tells, the plant tells me, hello, I need some water. I recently joined what they call quantified self movement. It's something that you probably know that there are so many things to track. For instance, here, my weight is going down and down and down. You can see when I went to the surgery, in one week, I went seven kilos less, 40 pounds. This, you are gonna ask me, what do you need this? I don't know. I'm just creating my big data, personal big data, and I'm measuring the CO2 level of my room. As you can see, at night, it's increasing, and when I do the procedure, which is open window, the temperature falls, and the air is, well, according to the, the agencies, 2,000 per parts per million of CO2, it's already fine, but not more. We are almost like here at 4,000, so you need to open the window. Move, probably you use this software in your app, in your cell phone. I can tell all the places I've gone. I know that my carrier can tell that too, but why I cannot think? Huh? You can tell here where I, I am living, uh, where I drop my kids at the school. In uh, uh, orange is, is my car, green is walking. So when I go to the World Mobile Congress in Barcelona, there were two venues, so you could tell uh, in each one. And you need a uh, move O scope yeah, to get this data and represent it like this. This is an application that I recommend you for, for doing these things. We are losing the ability to enjoy, to enjoy the important moments. You can tell here. Please don't be smart, be wise. If you go to the mountain and find these things, every time it's going more normal, uh, about info technologies, Google Street View already went to all the to the places, but now they are going to uh, walking mountains and different things. Self-driving technologies. You probably heard about the urban challenge. After 10 years, Google has bought most of these teams at Stanford and also at MIT, creating this Google self-driving car. It collects almost a city, 750 megabytes per second information. To process all these things, it needs to create this thing. This is the things that you don't see when they talk about Google self-driving car. This is what the car sees inside, and you create a world of obstacles, uh, which has to be processed in real time, of course. And one last thing. The intelligent man knows everything. The wise man knows everybody. So, connections matter. Could you tell me what uh, is the common thing of these two objects? Carbon? Yeah. Good. Well, depending on how you connect this matter, you create graphite, which is soft and dark, or you create diamonds, which is hard and clear. So, the properties don't reside in the carbon atoms. 
they arise because the interconnections between them. So similarly, the pattern of connection among us, among people, confers upon the groups of people different properties. Our experience of the world depends on the structure of these networks in which we are residing. That's so important that we are here in this conference because we are creating a network of people, of interesting people, and interested on optoelectronics and photonics. I, you create your network and you study this network and the density. For instance, the people with two or more common links with me. You can follow this thing. It's pretty easy with the tools that you have to do this, to see where are your circles. Uh, for instance, at Stanford, at MIT, at Barcelona, at Madrid, different people that you know all around the world. And you can create and study this. If you represent the world, you will find that many, many things that you don't know uh, are ha happening. I would just finish my talk today with a five-minute video that I prepared as how I see the future. Hmm? The future of uh, these things. Let's talk about human-machine interaction. We won't take and touch the computer anymore. You can control it by hand, but just follow it. Leap motion is something that allows you to create this. There are already applications to control, pan, zoom, and 3D modeling, or just by controlling places. It's much more refined than Kinect. You can have 10 different points. Look, this is an hospital. It's it's a real application already, so you cannot infect the tools or infect the patient switching things. Between this guy and this ball, there is 600 miles. You can collaborate remotely like this. Is it nicer if you like bar charts and bar charts? Or if you are educating mass, presenting your functions like that. Let's talk about biotech for everyone. In her birthday, I gave the best picture that was taken from my wife. I took some saliva and I sent it to a lab in LA. And after six weeks, this sample was processed. They extracted the DNA and they copy it. They amplify it a lot, a lot of times. So they could measure and sequence her DNA genome. So then I have all, and she has all the things and information, genetic of what can she has, uh, expected uh, youth, illness. Let's talk also about real world, virtual world. Since 2002, real and synthetic worlds merge. Now look at the here, you can see in video that all the people here, nothing happened to them. You see Leonardo DiCaprio, nothing happened to the people, but you're mixing real video with uh, synthetic, and your eyes cannot distinguish anymore. If you like to play, let's get an avatar. Let's put a sensor in your hands, ankles, and here. It's a really different way to control your avatars. More precise, 
are exactly what you do. If you also like to play and kill whatever, huh? why don't you put a laptop and these two things and this virtual world, you map it in a real world, in a real room, and then you create all these things. We all the time we are talking about wearables. Now you can sense your action potentials and you can control things like presentations, like this, just measuring your acting potential from your brain. At home, you could chicken. No, wait. No. Let's go chicken. On Sunday, the typical thing you go on Sunday afternoon, you go with your four wheel thing and you control it. Or I like skiing. For instance, double, mortal, up. Two airtime seconds. Go to Facebook directly. If you like motorbiking, you have a glove with six points, discrete touch points, that can order things. All my family wears this thing. You just sign, and you know how many steps you did that day, how many stairs you climbed, and just adding a little piece of thing in your sport shoes, you can know the hang time, the vertical, how long you did, and how are, if you are a sport person, how are you doing? Nanotech. We talk about nanotechnologies, but what's the, one of the first products? Typical thing here in Spain. You make a stain of two liters of, of red wine. What happened? Magic? No, nanotechnology. If you change the axis, huh? if you change the axis of the water molecules, you can do these things. Super hydrophobic fabric. Eight liters, two gallons of water in my cotton shirt. Magic? No, technology. Imagine how it can change the world, these things. With the water molecules. This is called chocolate. I think this is mustard and let's talk about drones what about drones this aerial robotics but let's do it more difficult let's do a mesh a network of drones collaborating let's put here and they go and now let's make it more difficult left hand side an eight playing an eight they don't crash they collaborate they wait themselves imagine we put, we change the center of mass to this, and we control the drone in a way that no drop of water is falling from the glass. It's robotics, electronics, telecommunication, all in one place to do this marvelous thing. And let's finish. If you think a little bit with the creativity of my friends in Barcelona going to the Sagrada Familia at say, 6 a.m. before the sun rise, with a drone you can have a views that even Gaudí, the architect, could even imagine of his marble Sagrada Familia. With all this, I urge you to think to global to collaborate and to keep enjoying on these incredible uh, times that is coming with all this technology. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks a lot, Sandro. Thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, we hope uh, you uh, have uh, enjoyed uh, the disciplinary session, and you and we hope a very big uh, uh, 
success from this ECOC edition. And finally, we hope uh, your, uh, that your visit in the city of Valence with our uh, cultural uh, Mediterranean still of life. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.